Thank you very much for your time, Minister. Let me first ask, because uh, this cyber attack occurred at the same time as the G7 meeting, um, it seems timely, did you come up with uh, a workable policy uh, solution for a defense against such cyber attacks? Well, the G7 has already set in place a, a cyber attack working group uh, that has been working for several months, and of course the mandate has been confirmed and reinforced. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about the implications for security, for cyber security of the digitalization of the economy. We have reiterated our commitment as G7 to be proactive and have a leadership function in dealing concretely with these uh, threats, including by involving the private sector to develop more effective cyber defense systems. What do you think about the use of Bitcoin in this attack? Um, it's been an interesting phenomenon to watch the last five years, and it's come to an all-time high last week of more than $1,800 apiece. Well, this is yet another example of how policymakers, both nationally and globally, have to face up to new challenges. These are the Bitcoin digital economy are there to stay, and the success you mentioned just confirms that. So this has positive aspects, but also negative, undesirable consequences that have to be dealt with. And this requires collective action. This is the main message that came out of our meeting. Stamping out protectionism has also been a concern um, that requires collective action. You couldn't quite come to an agreement to include that in the communique. How important is it? It is important. Protectionism is off the table. Uh, I think that there was no disagreement on the fact that trade promotes growth and has to be inclusive. So I am very satisfied. We, of course, we need to make steps forward. There are different views across the G7 and the G20 uh, for that. But I am confident that we can uh, reach common views on, even on these issues. How was working with the U.S. delegation and Secretary Mnuchin on, on this uh, on this subject and on the in subject of addressing income inequality? Very constructive, very pragmatic. Of course, we recognize that there are different starting points, different views in different countries, but this is not an obstacle to reaching a common perspective, and I'm confident as we make progress and we increase inter interaction, we'll make progress in practical issues as well. Working together on tax policy is also very important to you. Uh, how, how was the U.S. contribution to the tax policy discussion? Well. Uh, I'm happy to see that the U.S. delegation joins the others, both at the G7 and the G20 level, in recognizing that the tax area is the one in which there have been more progress in international collaboration. This has several aspects, one of which is related to the digital economy, but it's also fighting tax crime, improving tax transparency and exchange of information. So I'm quite confident that we make progress in all areas as we move forward. Is it a more difficult subject when you focus in on Europe? right now? Uh, Europe uh, is not a problem. Europe uh, is a contributor, an important contributor to growth, and I think that this has been seen, especially when we discuss inclusive growth and the so-called Bari policy agenda, which we agreed to deliver today, which provides a framework for making growth more inclusive, of course, while respecting national diversities and case-by-case -case approaches. I mean specifically when it comes to, for example, Brexit. Uh, the concern is that the UK could lower tax rates to attract more business. What, what do you think about that issue? Well, uh, maybe this is not news, but we didn't even mention Brexit during the two days of discussion. Brexit wasn't discussed at all here? No. We discussed other items because the agenda proposed by us to the colleagues was extremely focused and concrete. Cyber security, taxation issues, reform of the multilateral development banks, and the global economy as an overview. But within that context, we didn't discuss Brexit in particular. It has been reported that you did discuss the Italian banking crisis with Mr. Mnuchin in the bilateral talks on Thursday night. Uh, how do you see the uh, bad, bad loan situation panning out because I've heard that it could improve more quickly than maybe the financial markets expect. We are already seeing encouraging signs of NPL stocks going down, stop increasing, going down to market solutions, which is good news. At the same time, as it, it is well known, there are some limited specific cases that we are directly dealing with because they, might, they will involve uh, public money to be uh, used as a precautionary support to capital. So from that point of view, yes, the situation is not 
finalized yet, but we're going in the right direction. Can you give us specifics as far as numbers on NPL's net bad debt, when it could be, uh, or how low it could go? Well, uh, the uh, numbers that have been floating around since very recently amount to several hundred billion euros of NPLs. This is a gross figure. It is uh, rough, grossly overestimating the impact. I would say that now we are talking about uh, tens of billions of NPLs that are slowly but uh, surely being uh, eliminated from banks' balance sheets. And the bank bailout that is expected to come for three Italian banks, how soon do you expect to have that issue contained? First of all, let me say it's not a bailout, and I like to underline that very clearly. This is a precautionary recapitalization which is being negotiated with the European authorities, competition and ECB, because this is subject to specific conditions which are being met by the banks under consideration, and hopefully we will close the deals over the next few weeks. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister.